Hey, good morning. Hey, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We are in week number 5 of our Galatians study, No Other Gospel. So let me ask you this to start us out today. How do you connect with God? You know, have you ever really thought about that? How do I connect with God? And our immediate thoughts are going to be something along the lines of, well, you read the Bible. Okay, that's cool, but there are a lot of people who read the Bible that never connect with God. You know, a lot of people who could school people in Bible trivia, but they are not actually connecting with God. You never see a transformation in their life. You never see any kind of a, a build in their life. It's just kind of what we do. We read the Bible, right? So you're like, okay, Joey, I got it then. It's pray. Surely prayer is how we connect with God. Once again, people pray a lot and they don't connect with God. There's an issue where we, we ask God, we ask God, we try, we do this. People across the planet pray to something, right? So why aren't they connecting with God when they just pray? I mean, is prayer as simple as, dear God, amen? I mean, is that as simple as it is to connect with God? How about going to church? How about doing service work, right? Volunteering, doing things like that. Boy, we can connect with God that way. Now, these are certainly ways that God, we, you know, that God wants us to do, and we, we work through these things, but, not, but doing them is not actually connecting us to God. It's not what connects us. Those things are actually kind of things we do because we are connected to God. They're how we respond to our connection with God. Does that make sense? But does it seem then sometimes that we're doing all the same things other people are doing? We're reading, we're praying, we're going to church, we're serving, but other people doing those same things seem to be making a connection to God and with God that we don't seem to be making. What's happening? What's the issue? Well, <laughs> let's recap where we've been so far. We have seen what this gospel is, and there is no other gospel than this, that Jesus Christ gave up his life on the cross for our sins to deliver us from the power of this present evil age for the accomplishment of the will of God, for the glory of God. That's Galatians 1, 4, and or 3 through 5 there, kind of captured, right? That's what the gospel message is. It is through that gospel that God gives us his righteousness, through that gospel that God provides us the deliverance from our sins and our hurts, hang-ups, and habits, right? We're out of all that, and we get now to live according to the will of God in a way we never could before. That is what God does through the gospel. The entirety of God's righteousness, God's approval of us, God's connection with us is through that gospel, but it seems logical we should have to do stuff, right? <laughs> Here's what we do. Here's the connection with God. Here's what makes the difference between you reading the Bible, praying, and doing all kinds of stuff and not connecting with God, and you reading the Bible, praying, doing a bunch of stuff, and connecting with God. It's one simple word. The word God founded, the word God always intended to use, the word God does use, the word and method by which God connects with his people is this word, Faith. Faith. That's what makes the difference. And you might say, well, when did God change the rules? Because, I mean, we got like 39 books that say do things and don't do things. And, yeah, it's a whole Old Testament. When did God change the rules? The reality is God never did change the rules. The rule has always been faith. Faith has always been the way that we connect with God. There has never been another way. Any works that we have ever done or ever could do, all the commands God gave were supposed to be a result of the faith that we have that God will keep his promise. Go to Galatians 3.11, just to get us a, a, a glimpse here. Paul says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And by the way, he's quoting the Old Testament there. He's not just like throwing a New Testament idea here. He's quoting Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Habby. <laughs> he's quoting Habby, right, from chapter 2, verse 4. He's saying this has always been the case. The righteous live by their faith. Still the case. God hasn't changed the rules. So what, does, what is faith anyway? How do we live by faith? I mean, if we're going to really hit this thing, we need to understand it because how we approach God in faith will determine how we connect with God. It will determine the works of God we see being done in and through us. It will make the difference. We must connect with God through faith in the finished work of Christ. Faith, like we said, a lot of people believe faith is a blind leap in the dark, right? 
It's just believing what you, what you just can't understand. You just go, you, like we said last week, a blind leap in the dark is how you break a toe on a vacuum cleaner. Okay, that is not how we approach God. Faith is a reasoned response to God's word and God's purpose. That's what faith is. Faith is not a shot in the dark. Faith is reading the word of God and making, uh, making your life based upon it now. Faith is not simply belief. Faith is action. Faith is action based upon a reasoned response to God's word and his purpose. That's what this whole thing is about. It's not just belief. It is behavior. It's not just a mental activity. Faith has gotten a taste of God's reality and now aligns our life in accordance with that reality. In other words, God speaks, okay, I believe, but not just up here. I'm going to act upon what he says. That is faith. So what Paul does in Galatians 3 is he's proven to the Galatians here. He's like, guys, it is not about the law. It is not about the works we do. It is none of that. What we're looking at here is the example of Father Abraham, right? And this is what he's going to chime in on. Go with me. We're going to get all of this uh, verses 1 through 14, but just go with me for a second to verse 6. He's building a case here because remember what's going on in Galatia. Judaizers are coming in and they're trying to tell these new believers, no, no, you got to go back to adherence to the law too. You must get circumcised. You got to keep the feasts. You've got to, to, to go over here and keep the law. You got to honor the Sabbath day and be, boy, you got to do all this stuff. And he's trying to lure them back into this. So Paul says here in verse six, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that there are, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Okay? Here's what Paul's saying. You guys remember Abraham, right? Yeah. And, and it's interesting here that he's using the word Abraham and not Abram, because a lot of the, if you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 12 and start 11, really, and start reading there, you're going to find Abram, 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 that was his name, and then later it got changed to Abraham, right, and that kind of thing. But he's already starting you with Abraham because he wants them to understand this is the father, right? Father Abraham, remember him? Had many sons and a lot of nervous ticks, okay? He's saying that's the guy. That's the guy. And he's holding him up as an example of faith for us. Because faith for us is just as it was for Abraham. It is to believe Christ every moment for our need. His sufficiency, his forgiveness, his power, his grace. We believe him to be our sanctification and our satisfaction. And we seek and pursue him as such. That is our guide. That is to walk and live by faith. So he's holding up Abraham as this example, right? And exercising faith as Abraham did is how we connect with God. So let's start today by looking at what Abraham did. Okay, what is this life? What is he saying happened here in verses 7 through um, 9 there? This is your homework. I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. But your homework is to go home and read Genesis chapter 12 through about 22. Okay, and that's going to give you the scope of what he's talking about here. Let's paint a picture. God comes to a young man named Abram in the land of his father, and he says, I want you to leave here. I want you to go to a new place. I'll show you where that is. So Abram packs up, and he leaves, and he goes. And then in chapter 12, he pulls him out. And he says, Abraham, he says, Abram, he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Pay attention, guys. He says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And he showed him all the stars of the heavens. And he said, if you can number them, and you didn't need to look through a cell phone to see it. If you can number them, then that's the number I'll put on your kids. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And by the way, in Genesis 15, as he's showing him this, God instituted a very weird thing. It's a very weird passage of scripture. In your homework, you're going to encounter this. But God told Abraham to come out, and he says, cut all these animals in half and put them over here and put them over here. Weird, right? So he tells him, cut these animals in half. You lay half of the dude over here and half of the dude over here. 
and I'm going to make a covenant with you. This is a blood covenant, right? What it, and then what it's saying is this is an ancient custom. They would do this. They'd cut an animal in half, put them on both sides. And then the weaker party, the one most likely to violate the covenant, would walk in between the animals. Yeah, the carcasses. Walk down the middle. Look, oh, he did. He did. And you get on down. And the idea is whoever violates this covenant, this is going to happen to you, buddy. It's a blood covenant. The one who violates the covenant will die. So Abraham is ready for this. He sets them apart. He, he shoes the birds away that are going to come and try to defile the sacrifice. You know, get rid of them. And when Abraham's getting ready, he knows what's coming. I've got to walk down this thing. A deep sleep falls on him. And he sees in a vision God coming and walking in the middle of those animals for him. In other words, God telling Abraham in that moment... This covenant I've made with you to bless all the nations, to come through you, to, to be the blessing, to number you, to make a great nation out of you, even if you mess up the covenant, I'll pay the price for it. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 22. Test time. Abraham, do you believe me? Do you believe me? Because now you have your only son, Isaac. Now you've got your only son, Isaac. I want you to bring him to the mountain that I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice him for me there. And so Abraham does. Abraham goes to the mountain. He's got his servants here. Very interesting what he tells his servants. He says, we are going to worship on the mountain, and we will return. Why? Because <laughs> God's already told him, I'm making a great nation, and this is your child of promise. God's already told him, I'll die. I will be the sacrifice in the place of you and your offspring, even if you should violate the covenant. Abraham walked up there, according to the book of Hebrews, fully confident that God was either going to step in or raise Isaac from the dead. That was his confidence. He knew God had provided the sacrifice. He knew God was going to provide the, give a provision of a sacrifice. He knew God was going to honor the word, accomplish the purpose. He knew this was going to happen. So he goes up on the hill, very ready, lays his son down, and just as he's about to plunge, the angel speaks up and goes, Whoa, <laughs> don't do it. I'm providing the sacrifice. And he looks over and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. That same mountain would later be called the place of the skull, or Golgotha, where the Lamb of God would give his life for our sins and step in and, <laughs> and make good on God's promise that even if you violate the covenant, I will die in your place. Even if you violate, I will step in. And you know what the Bible says about Abraham in that place? Where Abraham believed God to that point in Genesis 15 when he saw all this stuff, it says, and Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. You see what Paul's arguing to the Galatians here, this has never been about works. It has never been about earning your keep before God. It has never been about polishing your halo and getting up to the point where God owes you a favor. It has always been a reasoned response to God's word and God's purpose by faith. And the gospel to the Gentiles is part of that promised blessing. The gospel to us, the, the nations would be blessed through Abraham. That's the idea. That's the idea. And that's why he uses Father Abraham's name here and says that he was the man of faith and those who approach God by faith are the true sons and the daughters of Abraham, right? By faith, for faith, in faith. That's how we connect with God is by faith. So you might be thinking now, okay, I get that, but how do I live by faith? Last time I checked, God wasn't showing me the stars and going, Joey, I'm gonna do this for you. Yeah, last time I checked, God wasn't calling me to, well, he did call me to leave Mississippi and come here, but that was not quite the same thing, okay, <laughs> right? So how do I live by faith by that example? How do I live by faith by the example that, that Paul is giving us? Okay, we're going to look this morning at three keys to live by faith. Abraham set the example. This is our heritage. This is how we walk in the faith, in this gospel, in such a way that we do not fall back into anything else. We continue on faith. And as we live by faith, we connect with the power and the purpose and the provision that God gives to us. 
Fair enough, three keys. So I want you, as we go through this, think about, am I connecting with God this way? Am I bringing this to God this way? Am I walking by faith, or am I still falling into works? Am I trying to mix the two? I mean, what am I doing here? And let's get to where we're living no other gospel than the one God has given to us through Christ, right? Okay, number one, first key. Focus on God's power, not yours. Focus on God's power, not yours. The funny thing about Abraham, I'm just going to quote scripture, guys. Don't get mad at me, okay? The scripture talked about his old age. You know, you know how old he was when Isaac was born? He was 100. 100. Anybody 100? In, no. Because <laughs> I love what the Bible says in the New Testament, quoting that. It says, Abraham and him as good as dead. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just quoting scripture. Yeah. We, I was talking with some people this morning. Age is nothing but a number, but the higher the number gets, the weirder the noises are. <laughs> you know? Abraham could not do this without God, and neither can we. And that's the point. Go back to verse 1. Okay, Galatians 3, 1. We're going to get the whole context here. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit of works of the law, or did you receive the spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Hold there. What he's arguing here, he's looking at him, and he's going, guys, wasn't it Christ who was preached to you? Wasn't it Christ when you came to Jesus, was it by the, the law or was it by faith? I mean, look, he says, who bewitched you? What in the name of Elizabeth Montgomery is he talking about? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Paul's very sarcastic, right? So I don't know if he's just saying, who messed you up? What is wrong with you? Or he's saying there's actual demonic stuff going on. But in any case, these people were leaving the grace of God and trying to go back to earn it for themselves. That's what they were doing. And he says, let me ask you a very simple question. Christ has been publicly portrayed as crucified. The Galatians weren't in Jerusalem when Christ was crucified. They didn't see it. But he's saying the portrayal is in front of you. You are seeing lives transformed. Is that by the law or by grace and faith? You're seeing people who were one way and now there's something different. You're seeing people set free. You're seeing people change. You're seeing people leave pagan gods and coming to the one true God. You're seeing the Jews in Jerusalem leave Judaism to come to this. Is it by the grace or by works? The answer, of course, is well, it's by faith. We weren't keeping the law when the Spirit fell. So his point is this if it. <laughs> If you started by faith, what makes you think you are perfected or anything added to you by works? It is all in Christ. Focus on Christ's power, not yours. What power? His power to save you. His power to save you. Guys, why is it? I hear so many people so many times say, well, I want to get back in church, but first I've got to do this and this, and I've got to clean some stuff up first. How many of you fish? Any fishers in the room? I don't fish because I don't eat fish. There's no real reason for me to do it, okay? But fish, you fish. How many of you clean your fish before you catch them? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's weird. I mean, they're coming out of the water. They ought to be clean anyway, right? God doesn't either. We cannot clean up our own life before we come to him. That's works-based, and God's already laid a curse on that. We cannot clean it up ourselves. God's pleasure in us is based upon Christ's performance for us on the cross and the, through his resurrection. He's already forgiven. He's already provided this. Guys, we cannot approach him that way. The law does not save us. It points us to God, and next week we're going to talk about the relation in the gospel and the law. Okay, there is. We're not throwing the whole thing out. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. But the idea here is the law points to Jesus. It doesn't add anything to him. The law can't add anything to you either. It is his grace that has saved us, and we enter that by faith. That's how. Believing what he did on the cross is all we need. We believe on his power to save us. We believe in his power to keep us. 
to keep us. I love verse four. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Did you suffer persecution? Did you suffer the guilt and the, the, the shame? Did you suffer through the transformation, right? Laying the old life down, embracing a new. If anybody's ever been addicted to anything, you know that's a hard process. It's a hard process to make a mind change. You think it's easy, it's not. But how many times do we buy into thinking we, Jesus may have saved me, but now it's on me to stay with him? You know, whether we word it that way or not, that's kind of what we think. Man, I messed up, I sinned, God must hate me now. I've sinned, I can't be with Jesus anymore. I've got to, I've got to go get myself right before I can come back. Having begun by faith, are you now made perfect by works? Christ forgives. He sustains. He has the power to hold you. In fact, Jesus would say in John chapter 10, he said, look, if you are in my hand, no man can snatch you out because none are greater than my father. And if our sin could remove us from God, then how did he save us in the first place? Guys, the idea is, I don't, I don't know what you've done since calling Christ your Lord, but here's the thing. He forgives, he sustains, and you may have walked away, but he has not forgotten you. We talked about that a few weeks ago. The Spirit chases you down. Man, the Spirit will trip you. The Spirit will come after you. The Spirit will not let you go away. He pursues you. Why? Because he keeps you. His power, not yours. I would hate to know that it's on me to keep my salvation. It is not. It's on him. But also his power to use you. I mean, this is his power, not ours. He saves, he keeps, he uses. Look in verse five. He says, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. When Abraham believed God, not only did he become righteous, Abraham lived as righteous. Okay, that's a huge thing. We talked about that last week, the new birth, right? Something changes in you when you're truly in God. And when we connect with him and say, Lord, this is your power, not mine, suddenly we find salvation, we find keeping, and we find that he uses us. How many of us don't do anything for God because we know our limitations? God is putting a burden on your heart to do something, and you're like, I can't do that. I'm gonna mess that up. I'm not, I haven't been to seminary. I hadn't, man, I didn't even go to Sunday school when I was a kid. I don't know what I'm doing do you think Abraham had any thought whatsoever at the age of 90? Yeah, I think we should have a kid. Not in his realm, guys. But he believed God could use him. He believed God would use him because God said he would. God said he would bless. God said he would be a blessing. God said he would, and that is the point at which Abraham believed God. Guys, as we walk by faith, we must believe, as faith believes that God will justify the nations by the blood of Christ. That's what faith believes. Faith believes that God will justify Gardner through the blood of Christ, and he will use us to do it. Faith believes that God will justify us by the blood of Christ, and that is how we connect with him in this. Guys, focus on God's power, not your own. That is how we walk by faith, step one. Secondly, Line up with God's purpose and act accordingly. Line up with God's purpose and act accordingly. If we're gonna say, God, I believe your power, not mine, then get under what he's telling you to do and act accordingly. Act accordingly. Remember, faith is a reasoned response to God's word and God's purpose. Go to verse 10, or verse seven then. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham looked at the world around him, and he saw, okay, God's going to bless these nations through me. God is going to do a work in me. God is going to first produce fruit in me, and then from me. Isaac, the child of promise, is going to come into the world. Through his power, not mine. He's shown me how weak I am. I can't do this, right? I make weird noises and have twitches. But yet, God used. Guys, what is God speaking to you? How is God directing you? Do we believe him enough 
to seek his word, not as a means of, oh, hey, God, how can I please you today? How can I earn my way before you? How can I get some cred with you? Or are we reading his word in a realm of, God, what is it you would have me do? You know, how can I live out your purpose? Now that you have saved me, how will you call me to walk and how will you call me to live? Do we believe him enough to seek him? Seek him. Guess when we're talking faith, we're not talking about making stuff up. We're not talking about looking and saying, well, I believe God wants to do this, so I'm gonna go out here and do it. We're not making stuff up to believe. Our faith, like we've said in the past, is firmly grounded in established truth. That's where our faith is. Remember, it's a reason response to God's word. We don't make stuff up. This is not some law of attraction, name it and claim it, uh, blab it and grab it, whatever, okay? It is not any of that. This is finding God. In fact, poor biblical understanding will lead you to sensationalism, not faith. It'll lead you to read, it'll lead you to read the Bible through the screen of the newspapers. That's what it'll do. You remember how the blood moons were coming? <laughs> remember that? Remember how all this stuff? And, and people are coming to me, well, Joey, it's Revelation. I'm like, have you read Revelation? That doesn't look anything like Revelation. You know? I mean, we've got to get back to the word, guys, because sensationalism... <laughs> will only keep us faithful as long as the sensational is happening. This is why we've got to get in the word. Do we believe him enough to seek him? Do we believe enough to move for him? Abraham moved. He said, okay, God's going to bless me. I'm going to go where he's sending me to go, right? Sometimes our moving might not be as radical as leaving the state, right? But sometimes our moving may be we've got to surround ourselves with some new friends, friends who are going to take us to Christ. Sometimes our moving may be something that we got to not move uh, ourselves away from, but move away from ourselves, if that makes sense. We got to kick some habits. We've got to get out of the place. Sometimes it's just about moving and putting our play ourselves in the place where God's purpose can be fulfilled. But do we believe him enough to do this? Reading his scripture and making the move to act accordingly, right? Do we believe him enough to act? Do we believe him enough to actually make a movement upon what he has said? You know, I mean, the weather's getting warmer, guys. Weather's getting warmer, you know? Now we're going to start wearing shorts. We're going to start wearing short sleeves. Some of you are already doing it. That's awesome, right? What if the weather was getting warmer and we sit around going, I should wear shorts. That'd be cool, literally. But we never actually put them on. That's not faith. That's just a mental exercise. Faith knows the weather's getting warmer. I need to change some things. Faith knows that I must act. It's not just a mental activity. It's an experience you get to have by the choices you make. That's what faith is. You make a choice to follow God. You've sought him. You've moved on him. Now you're going to act on what he says. And now is the point where we get to step up and go, yes, this is what I'm going to do. And we do it. And as we experience him, faith grows. We see that power begin to unlock, not through works we've done, but by response to what he has said or purposed. Does that make sense? I love how Tim Mackey puts it. He says, faith always begins with reason and ends in action. Always begins with reason, ends in action. Let me ask you this, is your faith actually taking you to action? Again, not based on your own power, but on God's. So we're gonna focus on God's power, not our own, line up with God's purpose and act accordingly, and lastly, and this one's huge, see the cross as the end of your curse. See the cross as the end of your curse. Verse 10 he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. The law is a ladder that we're always trying to climb, yet every time we violate the law, we fall back to the bottom. We can't do it. It's a curse. It holds us away from God. It was meant to reveal him and show us his glory and give us a guide to show us how we need someone to intervene. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, as we'll talk about later. But the point of the matter is, we were under that curse. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Mm. Now it's evident that no one's justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. In other words, the law is always what I can do. It's not about responding to what God can do. It's about what I can do, what I should do, what I must do. 
Then he goes on to say, but Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Here's what he says. The curse was upon you because you violated, but remember, I walked through the the animals. Christ became the curse for us. He died in our place to remove it. And we'll talk about this next week, how the law has been ratified and, and made new by Christ and what he's done. But the issue here is that Jesus has done a great work. Jesus has become the curse on the tree for us. We live by faith when we believe Christ for every moment of our need. Do you believe that he died for your sins? I mean, do you believe that? then why do we still commit them so readily and willingly? He died as the end of it. He died to release us. If you believe that he died on that cross, he's become the end of the curse of the law for you, and you are now free. He replaces the ladder with a really nifty escalator that never breaks down. You step on, and he brings you up himself. By his power. He has freed you. Believe that. Define your life by his provision for you. The end of the curse. (laughs) How much of the curse do we wear? The sins we've committed. The sins that have been committed against us. That have hurt us. That have violated us. That have broken us. And we feel cursed and cast out. But Christ died for it to end it for you. Your standing before God is not affected by that. And our standing with each other shouldn't be either because we're all brought into the cross. Define your life by what he has done and step into that freedom. Step into the freedom In other words, take that, that burden that you have, and bring it to Jesus and say, Lord, this is on your cross. I bear it no more. Jesus, this hurt that I have, I step out in faith saying, you've ended the curse for me. Therefore, I will walk in your newness, not my oldness. That is faith. And when we step in that faith, when we exercise that faith, when we respond in that faith, I cannot explain it, but something supernatural happens. We find freedom. We find hope again. We find joy. We find life because Jesus is where our curses go to die because he paid the price. This is the action and the practice of living crucified with Christ like we talked about last week. Do we see him and his cross as the end of our curse? That he died for us. He died for me. He died for all my junk to deliver on God's promise to Abraham and to us. And this is how we grab it. Tony Merida says this, this is Christianity. Believing Christ to be everything you need for every moment you live. So let me ask you this. Are you still living by faith? Are you still living by works? You're mixing them up a little bit? Do you rely on God's power or are you relying on your own? Are you actually trying to understand God's purpose for you and line up with it and act your life accordingly? He says you're free, be free. He says you're valued, be valued. He says you are forgiven and clean, be forgiven and clean. And are you seeing the cross as the end of your curse? Or are you still fighting demons that he's already cast down. Very simple. What is it that you believe makes you a strong Christian? It's not the things we do. It's how we respond in faith to him. What's driving your life? Are you looking for God to work in your life or in ways that he says he will? Or are you always focused on yourself? Or or are you focused on his provision for you? What is it you believe is giving you worth and value as a human? Is it your chasing? Is it, do you think it's been violated by what's happened to you and changed forever? There is nothing this world or even Satan himself can do to you that the blood of Jesus cannot undo. 
So commit your life to him by faith. Look, so whatever's stopping you right now, just bring that to the cross. Because the effects of the gospel, new life, freedom, those aren't by works of the law, those are by faith. That's how we connect with God. That's how we come to him. We cannot earn it, but the good news is we don't have to. Christ has already done it. So trust in his provision, trust in his timing, trust in his work, trust in his intended results. Live by faith. Or as I call it, truly live. Let me pray for you. Our Father, we come before you and we thank you for the glory and the power of your cross. Because your cross gives us new life. It gives us joy and peace and forgiveness. And Father, if there's somebody here right now that does not have that promise, they have not walked and come into the newness of life that is in Christ, I ask you right now to touch them, Father. I ask you to speak directly to that pain, that hurt, that sin. And Father, draw them to one of our prayer stations right now where someone is waiting to pray with them. Let them get up from where they are and go and find someone to pray with so that they are made clean and whole in the blood of Jesus. But Father, if someone's here today and they're trusting in their own power, not yours, Father, we're not trying to line ourselves up with your purpose and your word. Father, we're still bearing the curse. Jesus, don't let us be bewitched any longer. Set us free. Grant us the faith we need to come to you and to be forgiven and set free, that we would stop relying on ourselves and we would step out in faith and find your power actively at work in us. And we'll give you all the glory for all the things that you do because we ask it in Jesus. Amen.